Sorry, let me just get this off. Set up and going. Okay, well, thank you very much, Eric, um, for this opportunity to come and, and, and speak to this group tonight. Um, as Eric said, my name is Steve Thompson. I'm the county's archaeologist. Um, I have been since January 2020. I started shortly before the pandemic. Um, I work in the Department of Planning and Zoning in the Community Planning Division. And uh, the county archaeologist, for those of you who may not know, does not spend a lot of time doing archaeology as a, in the sense of um, sort of out in the field being involved in in archaeological research, but rather my 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 days are spent um, reviewing and um, evaluating the copious amounts of archaeology that are done by others, um, mostly in the course of um, the land develop land development process in the county. I would like to um, remind you all that October, as it is every year, is Archaeology Month in Virginia. And this is a, a quick shot of the, the current poster that's put out by the Virginia Department of Historic Resources this year, um, promoting uh, African-American scholarship uh, throughout the state. There's been a big focus on African-American schools over the past several years, and here you see a photograph in the poster of um, some excavations that are going on in the school, um, Woodville Rosenwald School in Gloucester County. And if you're interested in a copy of this poster, you can contact the Department of Historic Resources and they will be happy to provide one. So, contrary to um, the, the circulated title, I guess, of this presentation. I'm not going to spend my time talking about uh, the archaeology of the courthouse grounds, but rather a, a broader context. Um, archaeology in general in, in Loudoun County, um, and I'll do it in three different ways. I'll start by talking about um, essentially archaeological chronology, the, the, the periods of time that archaeologists working in Loudoun um, are concerned with. I'll spend some time talking about the different phases of archaeological research uh, to provide a, a general understanding of how archaeologists um, go about their work. And I'll spend the last part of the talk talking about archaeology as it's integrated now in the land development process in Loudoun County. So, starting from the, the beginning, um, <clears throat> the first thing I'd like to stress in this slide um, is the fact that Loudoun County has been occupied at least for about 15,000 years. Um, there are many of us um, who would like to see that date pushed back even earlier, and, and, and as I'll discuss in a moment, um, it's, it's being pushed back. Um, on a fairly regular basis. But out of that um, nearly 15,000 years, roughly 3% of that um, is represented by European, African, Euro-American, African-American settlement and occupation. The preceding roughly 97% of, of human occupation um, in Loudoun County uh, is strictly Native American First Peoples. And in the table, I, I break down um, and don't intend to discuss it in, in great detail, the, the broad periods of pre-contact or prehistoric occupation, three broad periods known as the Paleo-Indian period, the Archaic period, and the Woodland period. And with um, great creativity, those tend to be divided into early, middle, and, and late stages. Probably as most people understand, the the Western Hemisphere uh, was occupied relatively late uh, by, by humans. And if we look at the entire um, sort of span of human history in, in the world, um, traditionally people of archaeologists have thought that that humans migrated into North America. Um, roughly about 15,000 years ago, 
crossing across uh, the the Bering Land Bridge during uh, towards the end of the last glacial maximum, um, coming from uh, Siberia. Paleo-Indian peoples, as they were as they're known today, um, are largely thought of as big game hunters. This comes from the fact that, that some of the earliest finds um, in North America were directly associated uh, with the bones of now extinct uh, megafauna species such as mastodon and mammoth. But almost certainly, the, um, certainly in this part of, of North America, the, the association between Paleo-Indians and, and that sort of big game is probably overplayed. Certainly, they were they were hunters and foragers, but almost certainly they relied on a, on a broad variety of of game animals, um, from large to small, and and a similarly diverse range of, of of plant resources. Probably the greatest thing to stress is the the, the profound difference in environment uh, at the end of the last glacial maximum that these early humans in in North America. Um, would have would have experienced and lived in. Um, very, very different from the the temperate forests of today. The, the environment would have been similar to the to the picture you see um, to the one side of the screen, the sort of open arc like um, lands interspersed with with coniferous forests. And much colder, much, much, uh, much wetter conditions. Than we have today. Uh, Virginia does have a couple of very important uh, Paleo-Indian archaeological sites. Uh, the Thunderbird Archaeological District in Shenandoah, or excuse me, along the Shenandoah River in Warren County, um, just across the mountains from us, um, is actually a complex of, of sites, um, including a very large uh, quarry um, of jasper, a very fine cryptocrystalline mineral that was um, that was highly desired for the manufacture of stone tools during the period. Um, the Cactus Hill site in Sussex County in, in southeastern Virginia, also a very important site. Um, important because it's, it's one of the places, uh, one of a number of places on the East Coast um, where archaeology has, has been used to push the argument forward for pre-Clovis occupations um, in North America, pushing pushing dates of occupation back um, well earlier than say 14, 15,000 years ago to 20, 30, 40,000 years, um, depending on the sites you're looking at and, and uh, the archeologists you're talking to. Um, given the fact that uh, this particular site, these particular finds have been in the news in the last several weeks, um, I, I thought it would be useful to, to put them up um, Hopefully you've all seen in your news feed um, news of the, not only the discovery, the discoveries of these footprints um, in White Sands National Park, which is a, um, occupies um, an ancient paleo lake, um, now largely dried up. Um, footprints have been found there um, periodically for some time. Um, most recently, some of these footprints, essentially fossilized impressions made into the, the gypsum sands surrounding this ancient lake bed have been dated, dated by um, organic deposits, organic materials from both um, layers above and below these footprints. And the dates are, you know, somewhere in the order of 21, 23,000 years ago. There are no artifacts, no stone tools or other materials associated um, with these footprints. Uh, morphologically, they're clearly human, um, but, but they don't, they, they form a very unique sort of archeological site, uh, one with, in which the only artifact are, are these impressions of, of feet. Um, but again, the fact that they've been able to be dated and apparently um, quite comfortably and at such an early date makes an extremely um, recent, important discovery. So uh, the archaic period, our next major period of, of um, 
prehistory in, in, in this part of North America uh, it concerns the long archaic period. Um, generally speaking, the archaic begins when environmental and climatic conditions uh, begin to approach what we know today. Um, the glaciers have retreated, sea levels have risen, um, shorelines are in much the same place that they are today. Tree species, animal species, uh, we're all much the same today in the climate. You know, apart from uh, periodic um, warming trends, cooling trends, uh, drying trends, and, and um, wetter trends are, are, are roughly comparable to, to what we still experience today. These periods are, um, archaeologists date sites of this period primarily by um, certain formal tool types, notably what we tend to refer to informally as arrowheads, but uh, which in truth are more commonly during this period, um, spear points, the actual bow and arrow technology is not yet present in North America. Projectiles are, are launched um, commonly with the sort of device, the atlatl that's depicted in this slide. Some of the larger so-called projectile points, such as those um, to the right of the screen, um, late archaic, broad spears are, are probably not spears or projectiles at all, but rather hafted knives, uh, long knife blades. Um, for archeologists, the archaic period is known by and large um, through durable remains of stone tool manufacture, uh, the bulk of which comes from manufacture of flake stone. And the, bottom, the, the picture at the bottom of this slide showing a a core, a hammerstone, and um, then all of the various flakes or debitage um, that gets produced during the course of um, reducing a, 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 a core of, of stone uh, to produce um, more formal tools. Uh, this is the material that archaeologists deal with. The vast majority of it is um, not particularly interesting um, not, and, and often difficult to to interpret um, and very almost impossible to date. So much of the material that we collect from this period, we really can't date to this period at all. It's, it's a much rarer um, formal projectile point and knife types um, that, that we're able to date based on um, similarities to forms that have, have come out of stratified deposits or otherwise um, dated deposits. Um, by the end of the archaic period or towards the end, towards the middle, we start getting groundstone technologies such as the axes, um, groundstone axes that you see uh, at the upper right. And then by the late archaic, we start getting um, actual carved stone, um, soft soapstone being carved into bowls and, and, um, and sometimes other figures. And just very quickly, um, I'm providing a map here showing the distribution of, of known recorded archaic period sites um, in Loudoun County. Um, you'll note the overwhelming prevalence of sites in the eastern part of the county, which is something you're gonna see again and again. And hopefully, um, if it's not already understandable to you, it will be understandable uh, very soon. So the Woodland period, um, our next major period of, of pre-contact Native American history um, in Eastern North America really kicks off um, with, with the introduction of pottery. Um, you're seeing various sorts of examples from different, different um, periods within the, the broader woodland period in, in this photograph. Um, there's also a progressive move during the course of the woodland period towards um, increasing an increasingly sedentary uh, lifestyle or, or territoriality um, groups tied more closely to specific, specific places in the landscape. Um, and by, by the late woodland period, 
Um, agriculture is is quite widespread. Um, large village sites um, occupied, if not year round, at least heavily occupied during the, the summer growing months, um, mostly in the in the main river valleys of the region here. That would be Potomac River Valley and in some locations along its larger tributaries where the um, the lighter the lighter alluvial soils occur, the, those sorts of soils that are most conducive to agriculture. And, and during this uh, woodland period, we also get um, the introduction of the actual bow and arrow technology. And at the top center of this slide, I'm showing you some true arrow heads, very small triangular uh, points that would have been affixed to, to wooden arrows. And again, a, a very quick slide showing you the distribution of um, sites with material collected um, coming from the woodland period in Loudoun County. And I'm here switching very quickly to a, to a map showing all uh, pre-contact era sites in the county. Um, the, the, the sudden jump in, in the number of sites um, between those earlier slides simply reflects the fact that many, many sites, probably the majority of Native American pre-contact era sites uh, recorded in the county cannot be dated uh, because they, they simply haven't produced um, chronologically diagnostic material. There hasn't been, you know, those sorts of characteristic um, or, or uh, more readily dated formal tools uh, coming from the sites. They're just collections of of um, non-diagnostic stone or lithic artifacts, enough to tell us that there's prehistoric or pre-contact Native American occupation, but um, nothing more than that can be said. Um, showing you here a map that um, represents the enormous amount of work um, by local historian Wynne Saffer, uh, mapping all of the colonial land grants uh, made in Loudoun County. Um, most of the land was taken up in Loudoun County um, through land grants um, during the first half of the 18th century. There were certainly um, European, African-American um, movement into the region prior to that, but settlement um, really didn't begin until uh, say the eight, uh, 1720s, um, but by the 1750s, much of the land, if not all of it, uh, was taken up. Um, this map is, is color coded to give you a sense of the dates at which land was taken up and you can uh, sort of make out that some of the earliest um, land grants were made along the Potomac. Um, and, and to a certain extent, um, the progression was one from, from east to west, though uh, settlement, as many of you know, um, also occurred from west to east with with um, German and Quaker populations, Scots Irish populations um, coming down the Shenandoah Valley, moving in from Maryland, um, from Pennsylvania, and settling in the western part of the county in, in, uh, from from the western side. Um, some of the archaeological sites. Um, from this early period um, that, that, that we have here in Loudoun County include um, this site, an um, ordinary or tavern site um, along one of the early roads, variously um, known as the Potomac Path. Um, whoops, I'm sorry, among other names. Um, we have um, a couple quick examples of also um, late 18th, early 19th century residential sites, um, a number of sites in Loudoun County from this early colonial period um, appear to have been occupied uh, not by the owners of land, um, but by their tenants or uh, by their enslaved laborers. Um, this site, known simply as 44LD0539, is located on the lands of Dulles Airport and in fact was um, identified and subsequently uh, fully or largely excavated um, as part of the airport expansion. Um, documentary evidence 
tells us that uh, the owners of this property during the late 18th, early 19th century did not even live in Loudoun County. Um, so the residential site, this is one of a couple, um, were almost certainly occupied by their overseers and or enslaved laborers. And um, this slide is giving you just a, a, a quick um, view of um, here to the upper right, um, a series of quite large pit features. Uh, this site had been uh, had been farmed for sod um, up until the airport expansion, or at least for a decade or so prior to the airport expansion. Um, it was heavily damaged at the surface and truncated, um, but what did survive beneath the, the plow zone of the level of sod farming were um, a number of features um, dug out and then subsequently infilled pits uh, full of cultural material um, that, that survived beneath the, the more recent um, damage coming from the surface. These pits are probably um, associated, uh, probably borrow pits associated with the, the mining of clay to be used for chinking and the construction of um, earthen chimneys. And they also contain quite a bit of um, artifacts associated with occupation of the site. Um, portions of a large iron kettle, center of the slide, and um, up at the upper left, um, a number of um, very smooth, um, either pieces of stone or ceramic, sometimes glass. Um, these are variously called gizzard stones, um, things that may have come out of the um, the internal organs of, of fowl, turkeys, or chicken, and quite possibly that's what they are, but they're also referred to as gaming pieces. Um, they may well have been collected and curated by the occupants of the site um, and used um, as gaming pieces. The analogy here being with, with um, West African gaming of, of various kinds. Um, another similar site, uh, this one from the Briarfield subdivision, also with a very similar um, period of occupation. Uh, the site was a bit better preserved, um, as you can see at the upper left, masonry remains of a, a large central hearth. A large shirt of colonna ware is being held just below that. Colonna ware is a low-fired earthenware, um, similar technologically to the sorts of Native American pottery that I've had up before. Um, by some researchers, it's associated with Native Americans, others, others associated um, with African Americans in Virginia. Uh, both of these sites that I'm illustrating here produce this material, um, suggesting probably that there was an African American presence um, in both of these cases. Very, another very interesting find from, uh, from this site um, is at the upper right. These are um, pieces of cow mandible, the lower jaw of a cow. Um, I think you can make out here um, the beginning incisions. Um, this cow mandible was being actively cut to produce bone buttons. And if you look at this, you can see the blanks where many, many of these have been cut out. Um, then the slide at the bottom, here's a, the sort of bone button, um, something similar that would have been produced, through, similar uh, produced through this sort of process. Um, another type of site in Loudoun County, this is a section of the, uh, the um, abandoned or actually never completed uh, rail bed of the Loudoun branch of the Manassas Gap Railroad. This section is located um, not far west of the current intersection of Evergreen Mills Road and Belmont Ridge Road. Um, this remnants of this, um, this rail bed um, exist in a great arc, um, through, or I should say existed increasingly um, it's being removed by development, but um, in a great line through uh, southern Loudoun County and then turning north, uh, running up um, west of Oatlands and, and through Hogback Mountain and, and all the way to Purcellville. 
Um, various Civil War sites, of course, are known in Loud County. Um, I'm just highlighting here a, a couple of earthwork sites um, on the eastern edge of Leesburg. The Fort Evans, uh, an early Civil War earthwork enclosure hilltop looking east towards Edwards Ferry and then um, another earthwork that actually spanned Edwards Ferry Road and, and provided um, to the point of, of defense um, for for any anyone uh, moving from the ferry west toward towards Leesburg. And here I'm providing um, various images from the post-emancipation African-American community of Howardsville in Western Loudoun County as part of a effort by the county to uh, bring centralized water and sanitary sewer to Howardsville. An archeological survey was done of the roughly 22, 23 acre um, community, which consists of a number of um, 10 or 12 um, individual, individually owned parcels. Um, a number of sites identified, uh, some with obviously surviving um, architectural remains, such as this stone chimney, and then uh, quite a lot of material culture uh, scattered in and around these sorts of locations. So very quickly moving on to um, the second part, um, of, of my presentation talking about the process of archaeological research. Um, archaeologists work in, in generally work in three broad phases. Um, phase, again, very um, creatively named phase one, phase two, and phase three. Um, phase one archaeological survey um, is essentially um, that part of archaeology that's involved, that, that is concerned with the identification of archaeological sites, um, finding places of, of um, past human use and occupation in the landscape. Um, phase one surveys look at broad um, expanses of landscape, or I should say expanses of landscape of, of all sorts of different sizes from very small to very large. Um, and this is this is, is is done essentially as a sampling exercise. Um, most of most of Virginia uh, remains um, fairly heavily vegetated. So archaeology tends to rely on phase one survey tends to rely on systematic shovel testing, digging fairly small holes, maybe a foot and a half in diameter at a standard interval, typical, typically 50 feet, um, one after another, after another, after another. And as you can imagine, and as any archaeologist will tell you, most of these are um, very uninteresting from an archaeological perspective because they have nothing in them. Um, that is, I think the first field work I ever um, participated in as an archeologist many years ago, uh, I was quickly instructed that it's important to know where things aren't as much as it is to know where things are. So this is really sort of the bread and butter work of a lot of archeologists and where a lot of time is spent um, just out in the countryside, um, digging hole after hole um, screening the soil, looking for artifacts, and then sort of mapping out um, patterns of artifact distribution and understanding where uh, human activity was concentrated in the past. Um, phase two work is, is a, is a site-focused archaeology. Um, once you've looked at an area systematically at the phase one level and uh, determined that there are a number of sites on the landscape, um, a number of those sites may be selected for additional work, um, essentially a closer look, uh, more intensive testing, which can involve shovel testing at closer intervals or the excavation of um, larger uh, stratigraphic excavation of larger test units um, within that concentration of artifacts, both to collect a, a larger and more representative sample of material uh, to get a better sense of the date of the site um, the extent of the site, uh, the way materials are dis distributed within it, uh, and whether there may be uh, archaeological features, say um, architectural features such as the remains of foundations 
or pits or post holes, privies, um, those sorts of things that, that might survive beneath the surface. Not all archaeological sites are um, considered necessarily significant or important. Um, only those sites um, that show a relatively good state of preservation have large or diverse or otherwise um, useful assemblages of artifacts, material culture, um, sites that can be interrogated to answer various different research questions um, tend to get promoted as significant. And then the final phase of archaeological research is um, phase three data recovery, sort of the wide, broad scale archaeological excavation, um, the exposing of relatively large expanses of, of soil um, and, and subsurface that most people associate with, with archaeological research. And I should also say, I mean, phase three archaeology is, is something that's done for um, usually one of two reasons. One is a, a strictly research focus. Um, archaeologists that are working, say, in academic or museum settings and um, are being driven uh, to the field to answer research questions, uh, will select sites that they hope can provide information to to answer questions. Um, we'll, we'll choose this type of we'll choose this type of research. Um, the other reason phase three data recovery excavations take place um, is to essentially salvage and recover sites before they're destroyed. Um, usually. Um, it, destroyed by, by development or sometimes um, destroyed by, um, by, by natural forces such as um, erosion, uh, repeated flooding, uh, that sort of thing. So um, very quickly, turning now to the last part, I wanted to take some time to talk about archeology span and the way it's integrated into the land development process in Loudoun County. Um, so, and this, the, the, the first uh, step of this is not at all unique to Loudoun County, but in any sort of project in the United States today that receives um, federal money or that requires federal permits um, has certain historic preservation hoops that, that it must jump through. Um, projects that, that sort of meet these requirements that we're all familiar with are many road construction projects, uh, cell towers, gas pipelines and other utilities. Um, all of these things either use federal money or and or they um, involve federal permits. And as such, they have to comply with uh, the National Historic Preservation Act, particularly section 106 of that act, which requires these sorts of projects to consider their impacts to historic properties. Um, so though, so any sort of project that, that meets these criteria will have to um, go out and identify through phase one research, um, the full range of historic resources that might be present within the projects area, then look more closely at, at, at those resources that identified to see which might be significant. And if, there, if it's determined that there are significant um, archeological properties um, that are going to be impacted by the project, um, coming up with ways of either avoiding or mitigating the impacts to those sites. Uh, sometimes projects are, um, project designs are altered to preserve things in place, but um, far more often mitigation um, comes in the form of, of um, extensive excavation and, and recovery of the information potential of, um, of those sorts of significant sites. Now, then within Loudoun County, um, as of uh, Loudoun County has required archaeology of certain kinds of um, land development applications for close to 20 years now. For about the last year and a half, almost two years, almost every type of um, commercial land development application in Loudoun County 
is now required to um, do at least a certain amount of of archaeology uh, to understand what what may be lost um, through development of that land. Um, legislative applications, those sorts of applications that um, go before the county's planning commission and board of supervisors. And these are things like rezonings, um, special exceptions that are that are um, um, applications to to add a, a, a otherwise disallowed use on a certain piece of property. Um, all of those types of applications must um, include a phase one archaeological survey that identifies archaeological sites on the property. And as of a couple of years ago, just about every type of um, administrative or by right application, uh, subdivision site plans, construction plans, county road plans also have to provide that phase one archaeological survey. Um, so that consideration of the application is allowed to consider what might be um, destroyed if that if that application is approved and allowed and development allowed to go forward. Um, over the past 20 years, uh, Loudoun County, uh, through these largely through these these local municipal regulations, um, has has managed to provide phase one archaeological survey coverage of um, well in excess of 70,000 acres. Um, as you can see, most of it is concentrated in eastern Loudoun County. Um, and going back to the to the earlier slides that I showed, um, this is precisely the reason why um, so many of the archaeological sites that are recorded in Loudoun County exist in the eastern part of the county. Um, wild development is, uh, without a doubt, enormously destructive. Um, to the archaeological record, certainly, provided there is um, adequate leg I don't want to say legislation, adequate um, regulations in place, it can also um, th there's it can also be the case that development allows us um, to learn quite a bit uh, about the archaeology of the land that's being developed. So we're um, I wouldn't be at all surprised if by the end of this year, or certainly the end of next year, if um, the, the total sites in, in Loudoun County doesn't um, exceed 2,000. It, it's, the county is extremely well known archaeologically. So in addition to, um, in addition to mitigating impacts to archaeological sites through their wholesale excavation, um, Sites in Loudoun County are also quite regularly um, preserved in place through avoidance. And I'm just going to give you a few quick examples of um, developments in the past um, couple of decades that have phase one surveys conducted in advance of this work have identified sites um, on the property. Subsequent um, evaluations of the sites have determined that they are significant that they contain significant deposits. They're important sites. Um, and rather than um, excavate them fully and build over them, design plans have actually been changed and, and sites um, separated out and, and protected from development. Now, this is an example in eastern Loudoun County, uh, not far east of Dulles Town Center. Um, for a late 18th, early 19th century site, probably associated with um, an, an early tenant or, or enslaved occupation has been essentially carved out from the development area and, and protected from development. Um, another more recent example, this is um, land that is being actively developed um, in southern Loudoun County within the very large um, Heartland subdivision. Um, this site, 44 LD 1819, um, is one of several um, kiln sites known kiln sites known in Loudoun County, places where um, pottery was being produced. Um, it's, it's an extremely rare type of site in Loudoun County. Um, 
and this site also has been development, which is you can this slide um, on the right hand side of the screen is from this year. Um, you can see the very active development of what's to be the subdivision, and you can see the um, very stout silt fence that's preventing um, machinery to inadvertently run into this part of the site. Uh, the kiln exists in this wooded area, um, and we're, we're hopeful that the site will be further protected by being placed within an easement and granted to the county. Um, another similar case, uh, this one is from Lovettsville Community Park. Again, uh, this is a county-owned property. Um, the county surveyed, did a phase one archaeological survey of the property um, maybe 12, 15 years ago, identified a series of sites. Um, this one here highlighted um, the farmstead associated with Henry Roos, um, early 19, possibly late 18th century, early 19th century farmstead site um, with very clear impact um, subsurface features um, considered to be an important site. That's been um, development um, of the park as is, is avoiding that site, which also, I don't know if you can quite make it out there, there's one of um, Loudon's legend trees, a very large pin oak um, that's also being protected from development right beside this archaeological site. And then very quickly, the last thing I want to touch on um, is, is Loudon's continuing efforts to protect cemeteries um, during the land development process throughout the county. Um, cemeteries, uh, they, they pop up in the news with some regularity. Um, increasingly, there's, there's a lot of public outcry uh, because of their poor treatment. Um, as many of you know, cemeteries can often be difficult to see um, by the untrained eye, um, very easy to miss, um, all too easy to ignore sometimes. And since the beginning of, uh, since January 1, 2020, Loudoun County has been uh, doing quite a bit to protect cemeteries. Uh, in addition to a phase one archeological survey um, of areas of a property that are going to be actively developed. The county now requires that the entire property um, that's coming forward as part of the land act, a application process be looked at systematically, at least walked over um, by experienced cultural resource professionals with the goal being to um, look for possible visible surface evidence of cemeteries or graves. Um, if cemeteries are identified or exist on developing properties, um, the applicant is required to undertake an archeological delineation to more definitive define the boundary of the burial area. The boundary is required, a uh, fence is, is, is to be erected around the boundary and buffers um, extending out a total of 50 feet from that fenced perimeter of the burial area uh, are required to be established. And within these buffers, uh, very little can take place. Uh, vegetation, um, you know, can, can be maintained, but land disturbance of, of, of any sort is, is strictly prohibited. Um, and the, the cemetery and the buffer, um, as well as an access corridor, um, has to be provided to the county in the form of uh, easement in perpetuity, which allows the county to periodically visit these locations, county staff to visit these locations, um, make sure that um, you know, the sites are protected. Um, and also members of the public um, have a means of accessing these sites should they want to visit them for uh, research purposes or because perhaps they have family members buried there. Anyway, Loudoun County, um, does an enormous amount of archaeology. Um, it's one of really just a handful of municipalities in Virginia to have any local um, archaeological requirements at all. Um, and it almost certainly um, leads all municipalities in Virginia in terms of the amount um, of archaeological research um, that's required prior to, to, prior to um, development of land. 
So that's um, hopefully um, not too much for you all. And I'm going to can get myself out of this. Um, turn it back to Shannon or Eric. Perhaps okay. okay. Thank. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Eric. Uh, so we'll now begin the Q and A session of the program. Um, so we have our panel here. We have Eric Larson, Historic Records Manager. We have Steve Thompson, uh, Loudoun County Archaeologist, and we have uh, Heidi Siebentritt, um, Loudoun County Principal Planner. So. Yeah, I was going to say, Shan, I can see a question already in the um, in the chat. And yeah. I'm happy to to answer that. So uh, it's a very good question. Um, Vir by Virginia law, um, artifacts found on private property remain the property of that property's owner. Um, that said, um, it, for, in, in many cases, uh, particularly for um, more significant sites, um, Loudoun County um, asked that artifacts be transferred, artifact ownership be transferred to the county, and the county does maintain um, a repository for materials recovered over the years in Loudoun County. Um, right now, it's, it's, it's really nothing more than um, a climate-controlled storeroom. Uh, the materials are there. Um, it, it's not a place that is currently accessible to the public. Um, people with research interests um, could certainly contact the county and we can provide access to it. Um, but we're hopeful um, in the future that, that you know, we can, we can sort of grow that, um, that repository um, into a, a more accessible and more active sort of laboratory if not museum-like setting. So much of the material um, found at these sites uh, is in the possession now of, of Loudoun County, but by no means all of it. Okay, uh, thanks, Steve. Uh, let's see, we have another question here from Debbie. Uh, when did native populations leave Loudoun County? Was it before the Treaty of 1722? And if so, was war among other uh, indigenous groups or European explorations factors in that? So that's, you know, that's, that's a complicated um, and very difficult to answer question. Um, I think if you were to be truly honest, um, you would probably say that to a certain extent, some Native Americans never left Loudoun County. Um, and I imagine without um, too much difficulty in looking, um, you could perhaps track some of them down, but not many. Um, certainly by the time um, the county was being actively settled, um, from 1820s onward, the Native American presence on the landscape was very slight. You know, we have early records, both documentary records and archeological records of Native American populations, particularly along the Potomac or on islands in the Potomac. Um, but whether those were the same groups that had inhabited Loudoun um, in the period immediately leading up to um, European colonization, or whether those groups were moving through the county from other places um, to the east, um, it is very difficult to say. Um, there's certainly certainly records of, of groups displaced and moving through Loudoun County, temporarily occupying the county. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, the the the, the, the sorts of date points that you cite are 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 good ones, um, and but explaining why uh, Native Americans left, you know, certainly a combination of all sorts of different forces. Um, warfare, disease, slave raiding, um, 
all certainly um, certainly fed into that. Okay, thanks, Steve. Uh, let's see here. We have a well. First, we have a couple comments from Catherine uh, to you, Steve. She said, "Thank you to Steve for noting the unrewarding part of archaeology: empty holes." I maintain that to remain an archaeologist, you you must be an optimist. There just got to be something in the next hole. And she also said, I am very appreciative of the emphasis Loudoun County puts on reviewing the impact of land use on archaeological resources. And let's see here. And uh, I think this is more of a question for you, Eric, from Catherine. Were any portions of the courthouse purpose built for the storage of records? Specifically, were they fireproofed in any way? There there was a fireproof vault um, that was built on the back on the back of the um, academy building. The date slips in my mind, but it's it's probably early 1900. Um, it was a fireproof vault. Um, it had like iron shutters on the windows, and it existed. And actually, had apparently had a huge vault on the like a bank vault on the outside that you would enter into the room. Uh, matter of fact, if you come into the clerk's office, we have a blow up from 1954 of a, a bridal party inside this this records room. But you can actually see um, how the roller racks and the record cabinets were were set up in this vault that's in the back. Um, of course, that became too small, and of course, it was it was removed and it was eventually turned into more office space for the growing growing clerk's office. Um, as of today, you know, we do, we have storage for our court records, both historic and, and current, um, all of our historic records here on site in three different um, storage units here in the courthouse. And then we have an offsite facility now for the storage of our more current records, just simply because the county, you know, has expanded so much in the last 50 years. Um, we are looking, actually, we are looking at a possibility of a you know, future expansion of our um, storage areas that will uh, include more emphasis put on, um, especially fire protection, environmental conditions. That's, that's a tough part for, especially for um, courts here in Virginia. Um, uh, most of the courts are, you know, are there, the smaller clerk's offices who um, are very small, their budgets are very minimal. Um, most of it comes from the state. Loudoun County, we're lucky because we are supplemented by the state, obviously, but also the county supplements us, and and we're able to store and and um, preserve, and actually you know, get the word out in, of our historic records simply because uh, as a wealthier county, um, we actually have a three full time staff members. That's all we work with is our historic records. So. Um, it really, it really depends on the, you know, the jurisdiction you live in on how well the records are kept. Um, if you're really interested in more and learning about some of the other jurisdictions in Virginia who have record storage, go to the Library of Virginia, who manages um, the court record system here in the state of Virginia, and they have a, um, they have a um, online journal, but also an um, online magazine that talks about some of the court systems they work throughout Virginia um, to help conserve the some of their records. Um, there was one interesting article. Um, it was in their last um, uh, edition, magazine edition. It had to do with the uh, records of the Nat Turner trial, which I was believing was in Northampton County. I, f sorry, I for forgive me for forgetting what county it was, but there was a whole article on there on how um, they were able to conserve those papers. So yeah, go to the Library of Virginia site. It's a wealth of information on how um, court records are preserved in the clerk's offices throughout the state of Virginia. Okay, thank you, Eric. And we have a question from Lori for Steve. Uh, she asks, what artifacts have been found at the new courthouse site? So the, um, there, there was um, quite a bit of archeology span that was done um, across the um, site of the most recent expansion. It went through the standard three phases that uh, I outlined in my presentation. 
Um, and earlier this year, the county received a report from the consultant um, engaged for that project on phase three excavations. Uh, they targeted a few areas uh, within the, the new courthouse um, expansion site. Um, as mentioned in Eric's talk and, and slides, um, this was um, previously largely a residential area. There was the jail site, um, a municipal site uh, on the western edge of that expansion property, but the jail building had been, had been taken down um, a number of years ago. There was no archaeology that focused um, specifically on, on that part of the property, or I should say in, in detail on that part of the property. Um, there was, during the course of construction, quite a large um, stone and brick-lined cistern for the storage of water um, exposed to the east of uh, where the jail would have stood. And this probably um, was a feature that was in the yard of the jail, probably was collecting water um, coming off the rooftops uh, for use in the jail, whether it was for um, drinking water or cleaning purposes. Um, I, I don't know, uh, probably a combination of the two. Um, further east of that, um, remains of a number of different um, domestic sites were investigated. So the, the artifacts, most of this is dating to the 19th century and even into the 20th century. Um, sort of standard, um, and there are bits and pieces of um, architectural features from some of the uh, foundations here and there from some of these, from some earlier um, houses and other buildings on that property. And then, you know, quite a wealth of um, sort of typical um, domestic material culture. Lots of um, ceramic tablewares, glasswares, um, personal artifacts, um, buttons, bits of jewelry, um, lots of architectural materials, uh, nails, window glass, some roofing slate, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. There was additional work um, done around two of the sides of the cemetery, the Church Street Fiscal Cemetery, um, trying to confirm that uh, there were no burials outside of the, the cemetery lot proper. And in fact, um, no evidence of burials outside of that lot were found to either, um, I guess it's the south and, and the eastern sides that um, the expansion concerns. Um, I, sh I the, the, you know, the, uh, that material, um, from the courthouse work is among the artifacts that are held by the county. Um, we do have a, you know, all of the reports uh, produced by the several different consultants who worked at different phases on this project. Um, I think it would probably be, you know, when we're talking about the um, mitigation of impacts to, to archeological sites, we, I think, need to seriously think about building into that efforts at public education, that that becomes part of the archeologist's responsibility that's engaged to do that work is to um, put together public presentations. Um, you know, those people who are most familiar with the research are the ones probably best served to do that. And, um, you know, given today's technology, putting together uh, PowerPoints or other sorts of presentations, um, that can be certainly done live, but then archived um, and, and referred to in the future. Um, you know, particularly for popular audiences, um, I think could be very, very valuable, very valuable tools for the county. All right, thank you, Steve. And we have another question from Catherine. Are all I identified cemeteries identified by any signage. I know they can be found through GIS maps on the county website. So no, they're all not identified by signage. Um, there, there was, there is the um, GIS data layer and that, that's accessible in various different ways um, that tries to put in one place 
all of the known cemeteries in the county. Um, and that, you know, that, that represents sort of a coalescing of, of resources from all sorts of different sources, um, a lot from early and not so early research that was done um, through the Balch Library. There's other things that have come um, from Virginia Department of Historic Resources, records, other things have come from just, um, you know, uh, map research, um, looking at USGS maps. Um, I can say having worked with that, that data layer, um, not all of the dots are necessarily very well identified cemeteries. Certainly, many of them are. Um, we are trying to, as these and, and other cemeteries um, come up in the land development process and are uh, subject to these new regulations, we are trying to, um, you know, putting a fence around the cemetery is a requirement. Uh, we're working towards trying to get kind of a standard fence type um, to enclose these cemeteries, though that's um, not always easy. Sometimes developers push back because they want something that more closely aligns with, you know, their landscaping choices. But we're trying to, um, to the extent that we can, have them enclosed by fences that all look the same. Um, we don't have a requirement that a sign go up, but in certain cases we can, um, we can push for that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, they're, they're, they're not by any means all signed. They're not by any means all fenced. And many, many, many of them remain on private property and really can't be accessed um, except by going through the property owner. Um, and then there are, you know, that there, there are provisions provided in the state code um, for, for property owners to make cemeteries accessible um, to descendants or to researchers. Thank you, Steve. And like Steve mentioned, um, the Thomas Balch Library's website does have a cemetery database that you can search as well. Um, and I know it does list uh, at least graves that were marked with names and and dates on those as well. All right. Oh, looks like we have another question. Catherine. Oh, it's it's more of just a comment. I was part of the cemetery survey survey in Montgomery County, Maryland. It is a challenge to know how to handle public access to information and access. Yeah, I mean that you know that that's always a often an issue with archaeological sites, um, and in fact, you know the, those maps that I put up showing site locations throughout the county. Um, you know, while the state, the Department of Historic Resources, um, does maintain a statewide database um, of archaeological sites um, with their locations. You know, it's all GIS based today. That information is is not. Um, generally directly accessible to the public at large. Um, and in certain cases, certain kinds of archeological sites are not necessarily, um, their locations are not necessarily accessible um, practicing archeologists, but you sort of have a, to, to request um, of the Department of Historic Resources that you be allowed to know exactly where the site is. Um, and this is, you know, this is done to protect, um, to protect sites from um, from people who um, knowingly or unknowingly might might do damage to them um, and you know cemeteries sometimes can can also um, can also suffer by um, unwanted visitation or too much visitation mm. or um, I mean, you know it's it's Many people are tempted by things they don't see often and like to carry away um, 
things to remember their times by. Um, and it's unfortunate. So, you know, I mean, these, um, these couple of uh, kiln sites that I mentioned, you know, we struggle with that. Um, on the one hand, you want to protect them, but, you know, because these sites can have, you know, the surface can be just rich in material that lots of people would be very tempted to pick up. Um, we don't know whether that would, almost certainly you do know that it's probably not a good idea to draw people's attention to it uh, because that attention probably will result in damage to the, to the resource. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a very good point. Um, it's oftentimes, you know, sort of a, a fine line to, to walk and, and to draw in regulations. Um, knowing how much information should be made public um, and how much should be um, perhaps held back a bit. Uh, Catherine also asked, do you have a lot of problems with people metal detecting for sites? Um, you know, I've not seen much indication of that. Um, Before coming to the county, this was, um, Heidi could help me out. She probably remembers the years better than I do, but um, I want to say about 10 years ago uh, when I was working privately, my own company, we did a project. Um, we contributed to the National Register nomination of the Unison Battlefield Historic District. And we actually, we hired, um, some avocational metal detectors, Civil War enthusiasts. Um, one, because they have really good equipment. Two, they really know how to use it. Three, they're far more knowledgeable about the material culture of the period than virtually any archeologist out there. Um, and they, they didn't even know about this place. Um, but that said, I mean, neither did the National Park Service. It was, you know, it was sort of a little known, a little studied battlefield. I've also done work in the Falls Bluff battlefield. And while I, I'm not aware of um, any problems with metal detecting anymore, you know, prior to um, development of the subdivisions sort of leading up to the, the western side of that, a lot of that land was uh, regularly and very heavily uh, metal detected. Um, I, you know, I, I see occasionally reports and it's clear that, um, there are places that metal detecting has occurred, uh, maybe continues to occur, but I, I don't have a, a good sense of, um, of how common it is in Loudoun County. And it, it certainly hasn't been brought to my attention in the short time that, that I've been here. Heidi was also on the. on the, the Zoom or the WebEx might um, be able to give a better answer than me on that one. Uh, I don't have a better answer than you. I think that um, that metal detecting, particularly uh, in uh, regard to Civil War sites and then battlefields, is probably more common 20, 30 years ago than it is now. Right. All right. Thank you, Steve and Heidi. We don't have any more questions right now. Uh, so I think I'll pass it over to you to, to Eric to kind of give us a closing statement here. All right. Thank you, all, um, everyone who joined our. Um, a, a virtual program tonight. This was our fourth and last virtual program of the year. Um, we're looking, you know, our next program will probably be in February for Black History Month. And we certainly hope it's a better world by then and we can do it in person. I want to thank Steve Thompson tonight for that wonderful and excellent presentation 
uh, not only the, like the history of Loudoun County through archaeological digs, but the, just the process of why we do archaeological digs in Loudoun County and the process we go through. I, I find that very interesting, and I think the public should know more about that. And I had until tonight, I had no idea, you know, how much ar archaeology was actually being performed here in a county that, you know, it's just is where it's constant development. Um, I want to thank Heidi Siebentrip as well for being part of this program, um, bringing us all together with Lori Kimball, my um, archive associate, um, to come up with tonight's program. And I want to thank Shannon Fuller, who has hosted all of our virtual programs this year. And I want to wish you all a good night. And just in the near future, probably within the week, um, this program will be on our website along with our PowerPoint program. So if you want to go back and rewatch it or tell your friends, about it, they can come in and watch the program or look at our PowerPoint programs. And of course, um, we're always open to questions. Thank you, Kath. Was it Catherine who asked all the questions tonight? And I wish you a, um, a, a safe and um, happy remaining uh, year of 2021. And we look forward to seeing you in person in 2022. Let's keep our fingers crossed. We want to go back to in person. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good no, night. Thank you, Eric. Thank yeah. you, Shannon. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Heidi. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night.